and get the tea from me. LVB. Hey everyone and welcome back to What's the Gossip and today I'm joined by Atomic Kitten superstar Natasha Mariah Carey Hamilton. <laughs> How are you Natasha? I always say it's not Natasha Mariah, it's Natasha Maria H. <laughs> you don't need to shout! Is that really loud? No, I'm joking. <laughs> I've just, I've just um, attached my microphone, so if it is loud, let me know, I'll turn it down. No, I'm just taking the piss out, yeah, you know, the big brother thing. <laughs> um, do you know what I love the most about you though, Natasha? What, what? When you're on a live stream... And I type in the words, sing you are. <laughs> I can pinpoint the exact moment you've read my message. Every time. Every single time. Oh. I see you scrolling and your eyes are going, yes, yes, ketones. And then you're like, Jesus Christ, not again. <laughs> oh, it, makes, it does make me giggle there. Have you noticed that every single time I do it, though, the comments get completely flooded and destroyed <laughs> by Atomic Kitten fans? I like it. Our little ongoing banter. I enjoy it. One of these days, you're going to fucking block me. <laughs> um, so, Natasha, how's lockdown going for you? All right, you know. <laughs> it's been challenging, but it's been all right. Yeah, everyone's kind of survived it up until this point. <laughs> <laughs> Each waiting for the pubs to open. Hell yeah. And my partner's got it. Like, um... In his diary, he's like, yeah, you won't see me for a week, babe. <laughs> yeah, we're going to pubs. We've, like, spent way too much time together. Oh, my God. So what's a day in the life like for you in lockdown? Um, get up, do some exercise, uh, sort the kids out, work from my home office. Uh, maybe go on a walk, um, get excited about the food shop and what shop I'm actually going to visit that week. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, also supporting my team as well, you know, with their business and mentoring and doing my podcasting and doing all my other podcasts that I like feature on. To be honest, I've been really busy, really busy, which is good because to be honest, just being here not doing much would have driven me insane i'm someone that needs to be doing things i'm always on the go anyway um yeah. being kind of stagnant like being in one place all the time has been a little bit challenging at times but we kind of you know we've done it it's been it's been 12 months of strange strangeness but yeah we, we've we've got there in the end the kids are back in school on monday so i'm thank bored. god <laughs> school prison for children it's just hard you're like trying to run a business and and you've got to be a teacher so I've been like the best teacher to be honest because I've been a bit like uh, do what you can and what you can't and if you can't do it uh, just put bite size on mm -hmm. and I'll come back here in a bit so the kids have been given free reign a little bit Alfie's 10 nearly 11 so he gets on with it Harry's soon as GCSEs, so he's just in his room doing his thing and Ella has been a little star, bless her. To be honest, the saviour has been, and it came a little bit late because I, I only got it the other week, is a whiteboard. So we get the whiteboard out and she can just like draw and write along with what's going on on Bite Size. Keeps her entertained and <laughs> keeps keeps uh, my work environment peaceful for a little bit longer. <laughs> Did you teach her about the important things like the never-ending members of Sugar Babes? To be honest, she's probably learnt more about ketones than anything the past 12 months. <laughs> So talk to me about your business. What is ketones? So they're called enzo enzo I can't even say it, exogenous ketones. Look, I'm not a ketone expert, but what I do know is when I drink it, I feel good. And that's important to me <laughs> because life is very busy, um, stressful. Uh, I need lots of energy. And what I get from the drink is all that. It's a superior fuel source for the body and the brain. Um, it's all about cognitive health, brain health, growing older, healthier, which is what I'm doing. Uh, like everything, like I've got loads of tools in my everyday life that help me live a more fulfilled life. Um, I exercise, I try and eat well, try not to drink too much. <laughs> <coughs> Liar. <laughs> um, you know, there's lots of things, mindfulness, meditating, drink ketones like it, it all goes hand in hand but they've actually made a huge impact in my life because they've just given me so much focus and mental clarity so I've been able to do all the things not only I have to do but that I want to do with confidence giving me a little boost um 
And it started off just drinking the drink. Then I've built a business from it. I've got a massive international team, like from all over the world. And I kind of mentor people now. Like we we do team trainings every day. We do one-to-one sessions and kind of help them and teach them what I've learned. And it's given women like their own independence, something for them. A lot of us lose ourselves when it comes to becoming a mum. And as amazing as that is, we we kind of want to, something for just us. So building that business from the comfort of your own home is a little added bonus to what's going on in our lives. So has it been a bit of a Brucey bonus having actually been in lockdown so you could focus entirely on the brand? I mean, you know, you do what you've got to do. We went into lockdown last March. I lost all my gigs. I actually ended up getting five. I've shoehorned five gigs in 12 months, which is quite ridiculous, really. But it was like, well, what am I going to do? Yeah. What can I do? So I already had my ketone business set up, but I just had more time to dedicate to it. And things have gone really well. And then I also started building my Live Better with Natasha brand. That was set up because I was feeling overwhelmed. I'd lost all my work and I thought, well, if I'm feeling like this, other people must be as well. So I thought I'm going to create a nice little group where people can come in, they can feel safe, we can talk about how we're feeling. And then a lot of my friends, a lot of the people in my circle are the people who have helped me on my journey, on my well-being, you know, um, adventure over the past few years. So I was just asking them if they'd come in and share their knowledge and give mm. us some like support and that was happening and yeah and it just became my 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 wellness group which yeah I've thoroughly enjoyed too all I've done in every single lockdown is drink myself stupid and watch every single thing on Netflix there's nothing left in the world what, what, what did you do oh my god uh personal development mindset <laughs> working on ourselves <laughs> not here baby <laughs> thing is right i've i've got to a certain point in my life and i'm like there's there's a lot of shit here that's not saving me what yeah. better time to get the magnifying glass out and pick apart my life bit by bit and try and heal heal from any past traumas heal from things that have shook me and maybe not saved me um and move on like you know next chapter like next Done that, been worried, worried myself sick for years, you know, had the anxiety, had the depression, had the career that wasn't, you know, bringing me the fruits, you know, that it was yeah. previously. Like, what do I do next? Like, what do I want to do? So I've kind of, I've, I've, I've started that. And actually, not just the next chapter, I've started a, a few chapters over the past 12 months. I've, I've really enjoyed it, actually. It's been um, really insightful. Right. So for anyone that doesn't know, well, like everyone knows, everyone in the world knows, but 20 years ago, you had the biggest monster hit of your career with Hole Again. Does it really feel to you like it's been 20 years? No, it's actually terrifying. Yeah. um, It's it's almost like it didn't happen. But then... Mm -hmm. You get loads of things sent here on social media and you go, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. We didn't release you are. <laughs> we didn't. We didn't, unfortunately. But we did sing it on tour a hell of a lot. Um, it was an incredible part of my life and it will always be there. And I learned so much from it and I had a lot of fun. Mm. Um, but that's kind of it. It's just that was that was then and, and this is now and... It's great that me and Liz still get to go on tour and we sing the songs, but I need more stimulation than just singing the same songs over, over and over again. So it's nice for me to start carving a different path and a different career, but also I can be part-time pop star as well when the gigs come back. <laughs> the best of both worlds. Well. So how did you get started as a singer? Were you always singing from a young age? Oh, yeah. I was that kid who was just just knew what they wanted to do from a very young age. I was... Did you have a karaoke machine? We didn't have a karaoke machine, but to be honest, my voice was quite powerful, so I didn't need a mic. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, I was in the school play at the age of four. I got the lead role. 
my music teacher took my mum to aside and said, oh, Mrs. Hamilton, you know, your daughter's got something very special. I think she'd be great in performing arts school. But we couldn't afford that, you know. We were just mm. a normal working class family. But as the years went on, I just still had the passion. I used to sing all the time. I ended up in a children's show group, which was called Starlight, the Starlight Road Show. Big bunch of kids going around the pubs, the theatres, the clubs, singing and dancing. It was like the last generation of cabaret. So we'd be like on stage on a Friday night in a working men's club with everyone, you know, they've clocked off work for the week. They've been down like the dockers, down the docks or something. <laughs> all, all they want to do is have a pint in peace and they're all, you know, chain smoking and here's a big bunch of kids on stage singing freaking cab songs from cabaret and all this. So um Were they like, fuck off, I want the bingo? <laughs> no, the bingo came at half time, love. But um <laughs> I tell you what, it was an experience because I went from just being on stage with no one taking a blind bit of notice to people actually putting the pints down and, you know, the women putting down the G&T and not even saying a word. And then at the end of the song, you know, giving me a big round of applause and standing up. So that showed me that the more time and the more effort that I put in, the better the results were. And I was I was just feisty and I was determined. And I think a lot of that comes from being a kid and being bullied and being the outcast and being different. And that was my way of going, yeah, I'll show you. I'll show you different. <laughs> like you, I used to sing all the time when I was younger. And like you just said, they'd put the pints down, but they'd throw the tables and chairs at me. Yeah, they're not going to throw the beer on you because that would just be a waste. <laughs> so how did you get started in Atomic Kitten? Did you want to be like a solo artist or were you in a girl band before? Um, I was in a girl band before Atomic Kitten. And you know what? I can't even remember what we were called. You weren't in Mystique as well, were you? Because Tina from S Club 7 just came out saying she was in Mystique before she was in S Club. To be fair, it was kind of a mystique vibe going on about it <laughs> like a girl that rapped and then i kind of came in and did like the melodic choruses um oh so you weren't doing all that check the bass then it will come again with the bump and flex no i wasn't doing that that's not my strong point i'll be honest <laughs> Um, I remember we used to go round to like this man and woman's house and they were like writing the songs and they had a studio set up. And it was the time when Britney Spears just brought out Hit Me Baby One More Time. And we were sat in the living room and watching Britney Spears do a thing. And I was like, oh my God, I'm going to do that. I'm going to be like on MTV doing a pop video. Fast forward uh, about 12 months, I was on MTV releasing my first pop video. It's crazy how life turns out. It's mad. So you guys released Right Now back in 1999. You guys released that song like all the time. It felt like every <laughs> single single release was Right Now or a remix of Right Now. Well, Right Now wasn't actually a success when we first released it. I think it went to like 39 in the charts and then went back. No, that's a lie. That was the album. I'll say that again. So right now, we, and it went to top, it went n number 10. It went top 10. Um, I recorded it off the wireless. Yeah, it did go top 10 because we did Top of the Pops. And then Kerry left the band. And Jenny joined and we had the massive hit that was Whole Again. So we re-recorded the album and then we re-recorded Right Now, which had a bit more of a modern vibe to it. I actually like the second right now. I'm going to put that out there. I mean, the first is a classic, but I kind of like the danciness of the second one. So when it came time to re-record the album and remove Kerry's vocals, there wasn't really that much work to do, was there? Her vocals are pretty much ASMR, aren't they? I mean, <laughs> I could be on that album. Well, to be honest, I wasn't in the studio when Jenny re-records this, so I couldn't tell you. <laughs> I'm being diplomatic here. Yeah. So you actually got dropped just before Hole Again came. Uh, wrong. What do you mean wrong? Wrong information. Wrong. Set me straight. Check your facts, lad. It's Wikipedia, babes. Oh, well, then, if Wikipedia said it, then. Um, it, it does now because I've just updated it. <laughs> <laughs> no, we didn't get dropped. They were thinking of dropping us because, basically, we weren't doing good enough. It was cutthroat. It was brutal back then. Plus, the Spice Girls had just signed another deal. They put all the money into the Spice Girls, obviously, because we still looked like freaking crap. <laughs> so we didn't have a proper makeup artist for years, which was mental. What are you on um, about? You nearly bankrupted the record label with the amount of money they spent on bronzer. That was after Hole Again, pre-Hole Again. <laughs> we were budget. 
before hooligan. <laughs> then hooligan happened and it was like, yeah, we were terracotta like 12 months of the year. And I mean, I'm freaking ginger. Like that's fake <laughs> town work on gingers. It just doesn't work. I see some pictures and I'm like, ooh, ooh. Glamour, glamour. Well, you know, we were kids and it's all about experimenting. Just, I wish someone would have said no. No, Tash, don't do that. But hey-ho. Have you seen the BuzzFeed article about how Atomic Kitten loved to wear posh going out tops? Posh going out tops? It was literally like, they might be wearing dodgy (laughs) jeans and hoop earrings, but they've got a lovely going out top on, so it's okay. No, but to be honest, the fashion back then, come on now, it wasn't the best. It was, was, I mean, I mean, come on. Is it whole again? Whole again video? I... It was like, I've got a great idea. Let's cut the waistband of my jeans off and make it a choker. Or or maybe not the whole again video, but the promo tour with whole again. So not only do your trousers not stay up properly, you've got your button of your waistband as a choker. I mean, that, that's, that's cut an <laughs> edge. <that. laughs> so what was it like when whole again went to number one and you were the biggest girl band in Europe? Uh, pretty cool yes very very good um a bit hazy to be honest because we celebrated an awful lot we were out an awful lot we kept winning all kinds of awards and the record label were like buzzing and we kept going out for dinners and drinks and drinks and dinner (laughs) (laughs) you know but we, we were working very hard we kind of went from Two star hotels to like five star luxury uh, private jets, helicopters, you know, all just mad, really strange, you know, for three working class girls to all of a sudden li- be living this like really luxurious lifestyle was strange, but we always kept it real. <laughs> I am. Um, I asked Liz this and she's very much a diplomat and she would not give me a decent answer on it. But was there anyone you were like, haha, in your fucking face? when you guys absolutely exploded? I think we were too busy to be looking backwards, to be fair. We were just like on the train of success. It was brilliant. Um, I do vaguely remember going back to Liverpool and going out for a drink with my dad and bumping into like a boy I went to school with. And he was like so starstruck. And he was like (laughs) asking me about this car that I was driving. Well, actually, I wasn't driving it because I didn't have a driving license. My mum, I gave it to my (laughs) mum. And um, yeah, he asked me out on a date and I was like, nah, you're all right. That was good. That was good. That felt oh, good. You showed him. Oh, you God. then kept Destiny's Child off the number one spot. How the hell did that make you feel that Beyonce was breathing down your neck? <laughs> I was like, Sasha, not so fierce. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think she was ready. Yeah, they were definitely weren't ready. Um, it was It was mental. Like, even, like, we were like, is this for real? Is this is this actually happening? But we'll take it. Thank you very much. What were your thoughts on the record label following up this huge success with Hall again with a cover of Eternal Flame? Um, I was like, can we just lower the key a little bit, please? But they wouldn't allow us to do it. So, because I knew I had to do the big belty out bit at the end. Mm. And every time in the studio, I was like, oh, it's just too hard. And they were like, sing it again, sing it again, sing it again. And I must have, t- oh, by the time I'd finished recording Eternal Flame, I couldn't speak. It was so high, but it sounded good in the end. Liz told me there was issues as well with the music video, which resulted in reshoots of you three drenched in fake tan and bronzer. Well, what I can remember, there wasn't enough close-ups. Everything was like far away and the set and the lightning and stuff. So uh, do you know what? I've only just remembered this. Now you're telling me how bizarre. So we had to go back. Also, Jenny was really poorly. I think that's why there wasn't a lot of close-ups. The reason Jenny is flat on the floor is because basically she couldn't stand up. But, you know, as they say in showbiz, the show must go on. (laughs) Was she still cunted from the night before? No, she was actually sick, like some viral thing. Um... So she was just placed on the floor and people like made her look pretty. So yeah, when they got the edit of the video, they were like, yeah, you need to go back. And actually, um, I think if my memory serves me mm-hmm. right, on the close-ups, we're actually flip reversed. So I think, and I think like my 
pierced eyebrow is was on the left, but in the video, it's on the right. <gasps> Why do they do that? I don't know, but they flipped us. So we were like the wrong way around. My tiny little mind is blown. <laughs> now we're on to the big guns. In my opinion, your best track, You Are, which was added to the re-release of the album. You sing the whole track as a solo on the album, don't you? To be honest, I think a few of the songs were just me on them, but when they come to release them as a single, we shared it. Did you three have to fight over who got to sing what? Uh, well, I didn't have to fight for it because I was singing it all. <laughs> um, I think, I don't know, maybe the record label decided that it was better to be shared if it was going to be a album, uh, a single. So what went wrong with the release of You Are? We were still promoting Hole again. So we were whole again. We didn't realize how big whole again was going to be. Yeah. They kind of put out, we were releasing you are, but we were like the other side of the world still promoting whole again. So we actually didn't do hardly any UK promo and it, we knew it just wasn't going to be the follow up to whole again that we wanted it to be. So they pulled it before it like only went to say 30 bloody nine in the chart. And then, it would be like, oh, Tommy Kitten, I've gone from number one to 39. So it was a good decision in the end, even though it is a fabulous song. Then you got pregnant, Natasha. Yeah, that was that was a happy moment in my life. <laughs> that was the first time I'd ever seen a pop star in a music video pregnant. I think the All Saints girls did it before me. Nobody was watching. Nobody was checking on them. <laughs> okay, I'll take it. Yet it was me. It's all me. You invented pregnancy. Well done. Um, well, we tried to hide the bump in It's Okay. So I am pregnant in It's Okay if you... Aren't you lying down on the beach there? Did they just dig a hole and stick your belly in it? Uh, I think a lot of it is I've got a baggy... I've got a top on, a baggy top. A posh going out top. Yes. And then the, the bit where we come out the water was very front on. There was no side angles, or if there is, it's not of the tummy or not, definitely not my belly. So because the whole concept of the song is like, you're not here, but it's okay. Like I'm this like cool, independent woman. Yeah, I was pregnant. So. You were not the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to, yeah, they had to get clever with the camera angles. Oh, and then the tide is high. Yeah. The jig was up by then, wasn't it? The jig was well, fully up. Yeah. Like this ain't, you ain't hiding this bad boy. So they had to wear them. I think we had to, because our choreographer would like, you know, pull out all these mad moves. And I think when we had to tone down the moves because my belly was like swaying all over the place. And it was like, no, we need to just like tone it down. So that's why it's all quite army and shoulders to kind of make way for the bump. In the Tide is High music video, you were the most pregnant woman on earth. You kept a six foot social distance from your belly button. That's because I worked until about one week before I was due. So it was just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And in the end, I was like, I think I need to stop working, guys. So how long did the record label let you take off for your maternity leave? Six weeks. <laughs> six weeks. The kids get more off school. I know. It was like... Looking at it now, it's, it's it's silly. Like that's it. You can't just give a pregnant new mum six weeks and then like expect them to be back at work like they were pre baby. It was it was really hard. It was so hard. I, I remember leaving Josh because I had to do my first gig back was yeah. the Disney tour and I'd had an emergency C section, so my belly had been cut open and I'd only only just he started healing. And I was having to get back on stage in like high, like really high heels um, and like dance round. Like I, I just had my belly cut open six weeks ago. I've, I've had no training. We haven't got in the, we haven't been in the dance studio rehearsing my comeback. It was literally, this is when you're back, we'll meet you at the Disney tour, yeah. at the Disney show. So, and I remember just being so out of breath and sweating and feeling uncomfortable. And that was a moment for me when I was like, I don't want to, I don't want to be here. I don't feel, I don't feel nice. I, I feel really uncomfortable. And you know, when you've got like 10,000 people all there watching you screaming and you'd like blown up on a big screen and you just feel like absolute shit. It was just kind of downhill from that moment on, to be honest. Was there ever a moment where you wanted to quit? Yeah, loads. 
Was there ever a moment where you quit and they had to talk you back in? Yeah, loads. <laughs> oh, it was hard because I just needed a break. I just needed to turn off, but we never got it. Which is, you know, when you look back now, like years later, it's like, why, why couldn't you have just given us, you know, a, a year off? The girls still could have done all their projects and then we could have come back a year later, start a new album. That was never an option. That was never given to us. It wasn't like, you know, come back in a year. It was, well, if you're leaving now, that's it, it's done. Do you think the reason you suffered from postnatal depression was a result of only having six weeks with a newborn baby? Yeah. But I don't blame anyone for that at the end of the day. You know, I, I did that of my own free will. Um, I didn't want to lose my job. I was terrified. You know, those six weeks of the girls touring without me was hell because I was like, well, well, what if they just sack me? What if they decide, yeah, we don't need you anymore. We can do it without you. Like, that's what I was thinking. So it was equally painful not being there. But what stemmed that? Oh, my God. I don't know if I've ever said this. I probably have. So when we recorded The Tide Is High when I was pregnant, we got sent the demo. So we'd all been in the recording studio recording it, and we put it on, the demo on. Sorry. We put the demo on in our Chrysler Voyager. Mm. And they never put me on the track. It was just Jenny and Liz. And I was like, oh, my God, like, I'm getting the sack. Now you know how Kerry felt. <laughs> no, I mean, they didn't put me on it at all, not even in the chorus. Like I said, Kerry. And I was like, what does this mean? It was like head games. It was basically like, this is what's going to happen if you don't come back to work after six weeks. <laughs> we don't need you anymore. But don't you think that's, like, really harsh? Did they just do it with the tide as high or did they make them re-record everything without you? Well, as you can imagine, I wasn't very happy about the situation. <laughs> and a few phone calls were made and <laughs> few, um, heated conversations <laughs> pursued. Um, but, like, our manager at the time was like, why, why, why did they do that? And I was like, mm, you tell me. So, yeah, that kind of set an uneasy feeling in, in, inside. And then, yeah, it was just... It's odd after that. Now you know how Kerry felt listening to that first album. <laughs> <laughs> You're well, trying not to say anything. So we skip ahead now to the release of the Greatest Hits album. You re-release right now for the seventh time <laughs> and you launch a massive tour. But what was it like doing the tour knowing that the end was in sight? To be honest, I didn't want to do that tour. I, I wasn't well and I was struggling. And I basically said, I don't want to do the tour. And all hell broke loose. Did they start pulling that demo CD out again? Oh, it was, it was, it was difficult because obviously we know that the fans wanted it and the girls wanted it and everyone wanted it and there was money invested, this, that, the other, but I just wasn't well. And I was like, I don't want to do it. So being forced to do something you don't want to do is uncomfortable. And uh, yeah, it was the atmosphere was strained, shall we say. Um, it wasn't all bad. It wasn't all bad, but it wasn't the best way to end the whole Atomic Kitten thing, real realistically. But the good thing is, you know, thing, after things died down, we, we have done things together and we've been able to talk about what we all felt at the time and um you know how it in affected all of us from each of our own point of view because everyone has their own truth i'm not saying it was all everyone was horrible to me because i was very aware that my decision made a huge impact on the girls when they didn't want to end so i can see from their point of view why they'd be pissed off but my view is like when kerry come to me and said i don't want to do this anymore i i just said okay like, you do what makes you happy. If this is making you miserable, yeah. then I support your decision. And I was think I was probably expecting that laid-back approach to my decision, but that never happened. Oh, my God. Was there, was there murders? Yeah. Oh, no. Give yeah. me the gossip. Tell me everything. Yeah. But it was strained. Was it always your intention to just go on a, a break, or did you kind of yeah. want it to just end right there? Well, God, I'm too truthful. Ah! Uh, yeah, oh, fuck it. I'll just have to tell the truth. So we didn't want, well, I didn't, I'm not going to say we, I'm going to talk for myself. 
I just didn't want to go back to do anything. But the the line that we were to give to everyone was, we'll see you soon. But to be fair, we did come back soon, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> we did end up getting, coming back and doing bits and bobs, but... You went all dramatic there, like you'd murdered all of them. The line was, we're going to come back soon, but they're all dead now. <laughs> No, because uh, it's hard when you're being told to say something when that's not how you feel, especially when you've been brought up to be an honest person. So, you know, it, it was difficult on the tour when you're going, yeah, we'll be back. Time's, time's like the greatest healer, though, as they say. If you could go back in time and give yourself some advice, what would you say? Um, I don't... I, nothing, really, because I just want... If I... If I could go back in time, I would ask management to fight our court corner a bit more in giving us a year off instead of, of it having to be so final. That's what probably I'd have preferred more than anything. Do you think if you you were given the year off, you would have survived a lot longer? Yeah. But then I understand, like, once people disappear for a year, it can be hard to to come back bigger and better. But we were never given that opportunity, really, so... Who knows? So you all went your separate ways. Liz had a solo career and did Eurovision. Jenny went to Ibiza and never came back. <laughs> what did you want to do? Um, I got married. I had a family. Um, kind of chilled for a little bit. And then, I mean, this is really condensed. <laughs> <laughs> and then I ended up doing uh, going into the West End, which, to be honest, the audition for Blood Brothers came Right, I'd not long had Alfie, my management were like, there's an audition, do you fancy it? And I was like, no, like, I don't want to do West End. And they were like, oh, well, just do it, you know, it just gets you back into things, get you out the house. So I'd, like, get on the train, learn a few songs, and every time I'd go to London, I'd get a call back, and I was like, damn it. Hmm, this day out to London just to get out the house is kind of getting me further down the rabbit hole and before I knew it I was offered the lead role and they were like we want you to start next week like next month I was like what uh I live in Liverpool and I've got like a five month old baby that this is not going to happen and they were like well when can you come like we'll wait for you so then it was like go home speak to the now ex-husband I was like um kind of got a job in London <laughs> Thank <laughs> think I might take it oh yeah it was um I took the job I moved to London we were kind of living between London and and Liverpool it was hard yeah to, but I did it it was an in incredible role to kind of say no to like mm. you just don't get offered the lead of Mrs Johnson and say no I didn't want to be that girl that did that and regressed it for the rest of my life so I did it. Oh, absolutely. And, yeah. You'd regret that if you never did it. Yeah, it was incredible. Like, I'm not a trained actress, so to actually... I wasn't handed the role. I went through the full audition process. It was terrifying. Like, my knees would be shaking like, when I'd be stood there singing. And the act, when I had to do the acting, oh, my God, I could, like, vomit all over myself. I was just so nervous. Mm. And, yeah give me the role I couldn't believe it so how come you never released a solo album I did try to I mean I toured with Lionel Richie I got my band together I was doing like quite a rootsy soul soul vibe um but I just think it was too mature for my age because oh god I must have only been about in my early 20s then but the old like my to the fan base would I think it just would have gone over the head and it never just never happened but then you gave us some iconic TV when you went to Big Brother. What was that like? Hell. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to shout. Do you know what? I lit like that. You know what it's like when you have those moments in life and you just snap. I mean, to just snap on national telly is like horrendous. But when I look back at it now, I do laugh because, yeah, I mean, to be honest, and I've said this a million times, I did it for the money. <laughs> I didn't do it for the fame. Oh, God, but, nobody goes in there for free, do they? Yeah, but I did. I have now got an infamous 
um, like soundbite of me losing my shit in the Big Brother house. <laughs> when you agreed to take part in the podcast, I put a screenshot up of your belly in the Titus High video. And I said, oh, can you guess who my next guest is? And the top comment was, you don't have to shout. <laughs> I love that. Do your kids ever say that back to you? No, they were all babies when that happened. So, uh, yeah, I don't even... They do know it exists because I did show them because someone did a, did a TikTok or something or a meme and I was laughing and I was like, kids, look at this. <laughs> <laughs> do your we kids... felt like that all the time. <laughs> Do your um do your kids have any idea how much of a big deal you were? And still are, sorry, how rude. How rude. How rude. They're, they're not really bothered by it all because like that's just not how we are. Like I don't walk around like <laughs> do you do you know who I am? <laughs> do you know who I was? Um yeah, like they come to the gigs. I think for the boys, the first time they realized how big we were was when we got back together and did the big reunion. Because obviously, um, Josh was a baby and Harry and Alfie weren't even born. At, you Embryos. Know, so when we did the big reunion, they were like, oh, <laughs> Mom, Mom, I think Mum's band used to be uh, quite successful. And now Ella comes, like Ella and Alfie as well, they they come to like the odd gig that me and Liz do and get on the stage and Alfie's quite shy. Ella loves it. Oh my God. She's definitely, um, she's got to be on stage, that kid. She's definitely you reincarnated. I saw that Wigs video at Christmas. <laughs> Wigs! I know, yeah. <laughs> Who, what what six-year-old child has Santa for Wigs? I'm like, <laughs> what? What in the RuPaul's Drag Race is going on in that house? Yeah. So what was it like doing the big reunion though? getting back together and then obviously putting Carrie back in the band. What was that like? I loved it because I was, I was like in me, in me prime, shall we say, I'd, I wasn't that young, insecure, depressed, anxious, all over the place, younger version of myself anymore. You know, I, I'd, I, I was just like, this is amazing. It's all the fun, but without all the hard work, because we didn't have to travel the world. We weren't on the relentless promo tour. And, I'd kept my finger in, I was into me fitness, you know, I was fit, I was healthy. And I just was like, yeah, I'm ready. And it just felt like I got to finish off what I started years earlier in a good, on a, in a good way. Your fucking hair looked amazing as well. Oh, I had good hair back then. Oh, it was beautiful. What a mane. You like oh. Mufasa. It was all about that big fiery main. So was it weird putting Kerry back in the band instead of Jenny? Yeah, it was. I mean, we went to the initial audition for it, or the interview, should we say, the initial yeah. interview with Jenny. She was pregnant with the twins, so obviously that was difficult for her. She lived in Spain and she decided she didn't want to do it. Um, so me and Liz were like, okay, gutted, but... We understand. So they wouldn't take just me and Liz. You see, it had to be the three of us. And then our management were like, oh, we've had an idea. And I just was like, well, I need the money, so go on then. <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to do it. I was like, yeah, I'm excited. I didn't know how it was going to work or how it was going to pan out. It was different because all of our success was with Jenny. We'd not I don't even think I'd spoken to Kerry for like 10 years. We hadn't gigged for longer. So, you know, me and Liz were like very in sync. We'd still done Atomic Kitten gigs, even though we weren't a band anymore. We were still gigging all the time. So it felt odd. And we didn't want Kerry to feel like she was the outsider as well. So it was just, you know, it was a, it was a big balance in that. Um, but after a while, it just got frustrating because... We, we couldn't progress. Like, we were just doing the same songs over and over. And, you know, we weren't doing new stuff. And, oh, it just became a, very frustrating. Was the new lineup given an option to record new music? Mm, not really. We, we didn't want to do that. I don't know. It's like, for me, I, I had my family then. So the thought of getting back together and doing Atomic Kitten, like as as fun as Atomic Kitten is, and you can tell that like Atomic Kitten is fun. It's also very stressful. <laughs> <laughs> it is stress. 
a lot of stress comes with with that band and it was like no nah, i just I, I don't want to put myself back there again so it's been 20 years since hole again was number one i think it's about time we do another re-release of right now <laughs> never say never <laughs> Is there uh, any plans whatsoever to acknowledge the fact that it's been 20 years? I'd love to, is the honest question. Like, I would love to do something. Whether that's going to happen, I don't know. I mean, the gays at Pride are waiting for you, babes. Oh. I think Manchester Pride, I think you should put, you should go message someone about that. Oh, we do We do a lot of the Prides, don't we? Um, I'd love to do something, me, Liz and Jen. I'd love that. Will that happen? I don't know. You could do a Zoom concert. Yeah, it's not the same though, is it? Is there any songs that you recorded that you wished you released as like a single? Um, So one of my favourite, favourite songs was on our first album and it was called Bye Now. And that's such a, that was beautiful. I think that reworked would would be a beautiful song. Um, Plus it's a lot less high octane. I'm actually really scared going back out to these gigs. Like we haven't done anything for a year. And before we know it, me and Liz are going to be on stage doing right now. I think, we're, I think we might possibly die. Are we going to stick you are back in the set list? Maybe. Give over, Natasha. Just do <laughs> it. I will finally shut up if you do it. <laughs> I know. Who knows? Like, we, we need to kind of, we need to talk about it. I have got some solo stuff coming out this year, though. <laughs> I will pre-warn you right now, though. <laughs> pun intended, um, that as soon as you guys start gigging um, You Are again, mm-hmm. I will then move on to needing to see C'est tu passion live. <laughs> Where the hell did that come from? And why it, does it exist? Uh, it's just there. I mean, most pop bands used to do a Spanglish version. So what would happen is... They'd record the verses in sorry the yeah the verses in Spanish, but the chorus would be in English. Hence the word Spanglish. But we just went all in. I mean, we already had the <laughs> from bringing Scousers, so <laughs> we just did the full Spanish version. Oh, so you just said that you got new music coming out this year as well? I have, yeah. <gasps> Talk to me about it. So the end of lockdown last year, I got a phone call. Uh, from a guy who saw me perform at the Boysdale uh, Jazz Club like 18 months previous. Uh, he was like, I've been trying to get hold of you via one way or the other. Anyway, it never happened. So he got my number and he said, how do you feel about making some new music? So I just burst out laughing. And he was like, no, I'm being serious. So we we met up and yeah, we are... <laughs> We have already got a selection of original music. Some are still being written. I'm going to be doing some co-writes as well. And the next, I'd say next month, I'm going to be doing doing band rehearsals once we're allowed. Then I'm going to be in the studio recording my album. And I'll be doing some live uh, venue gigs starting September. Ooh. Is there going to be a solo version of Right Now on there as well? <laughs> Come on, one more time. <laughs> yeah, like a, like an acoustic version. Ooh. Come on, baby, do it to me. <laughs> Slowly. Yeah, so I'm, I'm quite excited. The nice thing about it is he knows what I can and can't do. He understands I'm a family woman. Uh, so he is very much working it around me, which is nice and refreshing. And I don't feel like, I do feel pressured because I'm like, oh shit, I'm actually going to do a solo project. So like, I'm going to be really exposed and it's all going to be down to me to deliver and perform and sound good. But the flip side is I've never got to do that before. And this is my time now to, to put it down and see what happens. I've got a very exciting year coming up. Like literally within the next month, I'm going to be recording my solo album. Like that's mental. Uh, About two days ago, my manager sent me a demo of one of the songs, like with the Mm. band. The band's been in the studio, they've been putting it all together. And I just like, you know, when you have like a heavy, the heavy feeling in your body, like adrenaline. And I was like, oh shit, like this is actually happening. Because 
everything's been so slow because of COVID. I'd love to see you do like a pop disco album as well. You know, something like, you know, like Louise's Let's Go Round Again. Oh, yeah. I think you'd slay that. I'd love to do like like a big funky house, house song, like vocal kind of vibe. Like that's so up my street, but let's not get too carried away. <laughs> <laughs> you just want to be at, you just want to be at a rave, don't you? Get off your face. Go. I can't fucking wait to get absolutely steaming somewhere and get barred from everywhere. I did have a number one hit single uh, in Brazil, Once Upon a Time. Natasha, you've had many number one singles. We've established that in the last yeah. hour. But on my own. My, my one and only solo release, which was called Round and Round. And it sampled... You know, um, Gyps, Gypsy Woman. Dun, dun. Do you know that piano riff where it goes? Ding, 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 ding. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Kind of sounds like Big Brother. Da, 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 da. No, she wakes up early in the morning. That one. Crystal, like, oh. yeah. Crystal yeah, 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 yeah. Woman. It samples that, but it was with a guy called Misha Daniels, and it was called Round and Round. Before I let you go, one final question about your daughter, Ella. Mm -hmm. Her mum is an atomic kitten and her daddy's in five. But who does she prefer? Should we ask her? Hell yeah. One sec. Ella, come here, please. My friend wants to ask you a question. Say something. Say hi. Say hi, Lee. Hi, Lee. Hi, Ella. Quick question. Which music do you prefer the most, five or atomic kitten? Both. No! Liar! Yay! <laughs> so romantic. <laughs> She's worse than you. My one favourite song about mums is um, Hold Again. And my favourite song for my dad is Kicking That Can. A We Will Rock you. Yeah. Brilliant. No, Ella, your favourite song by your mum is You Are. She's like, what is that? <laughs> You need to teach the children, Natasha. Teach I'll, them. I'll play it to you after this interview. She's come to get that whiteboard we spoke about. <laughs> you know, say, if there's one thing you want to buy your kids, get them a whiteboard. Oh, good girl. Yeah, thanks for doing this. This has been great. <laughs> You're very welcome. I guess I'll see ya. Wouldn't want to be ya. Let's not get too carried away. <laughs> it's Lee Stitch. Come get the tea from me. LVB.